Hey there, my name is Marius Becker and today we're going to continue what we started in part one and we'll keep on modeling and texturing our scene. After I made my low-res composition, I then start to organize everything by layers. So I can keep track of everything I did and everything I'm doing by different colors. Right now the low-res meshes get this pinkish-reddish color and the high-res meshes get this blue color. So I can quickly see where do I need to put high-res meshes, how much progress did I make, all that sort of stuff. And I highly recommend working in layers in Cinema 4D. I don't know how it is in any other package, but there are probably similar functionalities. But the layer system of Cinema 4D is really powerful, although I feel like a lot of people aren't really using it. And I'm also not using it to its full potential. You could go way further than I'm going here. But generally speaking, it's a way better way to organize your scene than just by creating nulls and groups. Because here you can solo a layer, you can hide a layer, all this sort of stuff which would take you ages if you would do it by hand, um, just activating and deactivating nulls. So I highly recommend looking at your layers if you haven't already and it'll make your life way, way easier. So for the high-risk measures, I'm also creating some high-risk measures myself on the fly. So for example, for this table here, what I don't know at this point is that I will replace this table and a lot of the furniture later on. But for now, <laughs> we'll keep watching me um, modeling this table. And with those high-risk measures and with modeling in general for my scenes, I tend to go a bit too overboard because you probably won't see those screws. But for me, it's really important that I can use this asset either in another scene or better said, I can use this asset at any angle I want. So no matter uh, where I put this asset, it will always look good and it won't be just for this distance or for that distance. Um, this is something that is really important to me because I like to explore my scenes usually like um, I would do with a real room, like going around with my camera. So for me it's really important to have all the details that I need. And usually it's a bit overboard, like I said, but that's just the way I work. Um, it's probably not the smartest way and I only do it for personal images because if you were doing this um, on a commercial project, it would probably uh, kill the render times. But for personal projects, um, this is definitely the way I like to work. And I'm also placing a lot of stuff that I didn't even um, do low risk meshes for, just filling in some of the empty spaces because I didn't see the need to low res model a mouse and um, paper clips and all that stuff. So this low res approach is usually only done for the bigger pieces, not for the small details. And I'm still not 100% um, sold on the composition here. So I'm still moving stuff around, still adjusting stuff. So it's an ongoing process. So I wouldn't consider what I do in the low res to be finished, but it's a very good starting point. It's the same when you do a sketch and then you um, paint over it and then you realize, ah, okay, you can do something more here or something more there. It's just a good starting point and it's way easier for me to work that way. Same with those paper clips um, that I'm using a cloner here um, for it doesn't make much sense to do a low risk model for stuff like that. But for the bigger parts, it really makes sense. I'm constantly um, comparing my current state to the previous state and always um, using Photoshop to give myself feedback so I can keep track of everything I'm doing. And this also makes it easier for me 
to not get too overwhelmed with such a big picture because it's more like a step-by-step -step, um, approach for me which helps myself at least um, to make those bigger images without um, sort of losing my mind or uh, spending way too much time um, on one part just working into the blue. So that, that way I'm way more organized and know what to do next. And now I'm adjusting cables. Um, I think I got those cables from Gumroad. It was a nice package with some USB and VGA cables and all that sort of stuff, but with handles so I can actually place them the way I want. And this really helps me because building a rig like that myself, I could do, but it would take me um, another few hours probably also to model all those plugs. And this is something I really highly recommend is get assets when you can get assets because spending the time to model everything yourself won't make your image better in the end. I used to think that way, but it won't change the fact um, that you don't have a nice image in the end. Um, usually um, we tend to try to build everything ourselves and to make everything as complicated as possible. But if the image isn't looking nice, then no one cares if you modeled everything yourself. Um, in the end, it's only about the image. Sure, you should know how to model, but I don't expect anyone to model everything themselves in their scenes because that would just take ages. And I know what I'm talking about because I used to be that way. I used to model everything myself and that caused me to work way, way slower on my images. And in the end, it didn't change the image itself. If the execution wasn't good, then it didn't help that I modeled everything myself. Sure, I got a bigger asset library, but in the end, no one really cares, like I said. It's just about creating a good image and to convey mood, all this sort of stuff is way more important than the technique itself, as long as you don't want to apply anywhere as a modeler for sure. But as a 3D artist and especially in motion uh, graphics, I don't care if you model the table yourself or the chair. It doesn't matter to me if it's a good animation, if it's a, a good image, who cares? And this is something um, I for, for myself really needed to learn and really needed to hear as well from uh, people that have been doing this way, way longer than myself. For the cables on the walls, I'm using a combination of hand-drawn splines, spline wraps and cloners. And while hand drawing it might not be the fastest process, for me it works the best because I'm not relying on some algorithm or some automated process to lay those cables for me that I then have to adjust anyways. As this is right now purely an artistic um, way of putting the cables, I think it's fine. Um, sure, there might be better ways, but in the end, um, for me, it's about those cables being exactly where I want them to be. And also, it's quite a meditating process <laughs> to uh, draw those cables on the walls, even though um, you won't see a lot of those in the end. The pipes I modeled for another job um, like a year ago, so, um, so since then I got a nice library of pipes that I can just copy around and clone around so the setup works quite well for me here in this case. And it really adds this industrial feeling in the end um, to this office because I feel like those are details you usually miss when you are modeling something um, like this. So I like to pay attention to those sort of details and also probably model way too much stuff 
like this sprinkler there that you won't even see in the end but i like to know that it's, it's there and also to see it somewhere in the bouquet because i feel those details really add realism in the end it makes an image feel real and not necessarily look real i think if you show stuff to someone that doesn't do 3d they usually aren't looking for clues why it's not real and what someone did there it's more about somehow something feels off and this is usually because there are quite some important details missing that we as 3d artists usually don't think about because when we are thinking about a room we are usually modeling a room based of our imagination and our experience of rooms and then we tend to forget a lot of stuff that is actually there that makes a room feel real in the end so this is why I highly recommend always having your reference ready I have my reference already um, always on my second screen so I keep looking at reference all the time when I'm modeling and building my scenes because it's really important to not forget about all those little things that make up a room in that case for example. And I'm spending quite a lot of time on those cables even though you won't see a lot of the stuff I'm doing here like I said you will either see it in reflections or refractions, which also adds to the realism, but also in the other angles I'm going to render of this room. And I like to, like I said, move around with my camera and not be restricted by the stuff I modeled or didn't model. So in the end, this gives me a bit more freedom to move around my image and to treat it more like a real room I'm running around in with my camera. And so now I'm doing a little more work on those high-risk measures, adjusting them till I'm happy with them and uh, just doing those details before I can move on to the next stage which is then moving to texturing and shading all my assets. It's kind of a similar process of coloring in your images after you made all your um, lines and cleaned up your um, drawing and then coloring in all your um, shapes. So this is kind of the process um, I'm doing here also using some mega scans assets here already for the plants in the foreground uh, doesn't have to be the prettiest plant because it will be just uh, swallowed by the bokeh to be honest so it's not that important that it's super nice but still spending quite a lot of time on this um, probably going to alter this at the end anyways but at least this gives me some starting point to work off from. And then moving now into texturing all the different assets. We are now at the texturing stage of this image, which means I'm disabling everything else in the scene but the room itself, so I can start texturing um, the room and the floor in that case. Um, I'm using a combination of image-based textures as well as noises and also some scanned assets. This textures um, I'm using here, I got from Texture Supply, I think. Um, some super high-res textures of concrete. Um, and also layering this up with some dirt textures that make sense for that floor so it feels like someone cleaned it um, a while ago um, all this stuff really adds up to realistic textures 
And for those smudges, it's really important that you use um, maps that make sense in that case. So don't use some fingerprints or stuff like that, even though the grunge texture might be nice, but uh, two meter big fingerprints won't really add to the realism. So it's really important to layer up this dirt in a realistic way so it makes sense and not to overuse it, where in this case um, reference again comes into play. Um, comparing this to flaws from your reference and trying to match it, trying to understand what makes this floor or that wall here um, real in those um, images. Because it might pick up on details that you wouldn't have thought about um, when building a texture without any reference. Before we move any further, I decided to do a quick breakdown of my node tree for the floor because I felt like it went by pretty fast and maybe some of you are interested in how um, the actual node tree looks like and what I mean by layering up textures to build up a complex shader and also a realistic one for that matter. As you can see, the node tree itself isn't that complex, but it's more about how to use textures you already have at your disposal and blending them with other textures to build up a complex shader. The main textures I used for this floor come from Texture Supply and are pretty high res in 8K, as well as some textures from uh, Cornelius Demerick and also some smudge textures from Grand Warwick. I started off with just loading in the texture supply, the concrete texture. And if we connect that to the output, you can see the texture itself is pretty nice already, though it lacks some interest. And to achieve this interest, I started to first um, use a color correct node to um, change uh, some of the gamma values, not that much, just a little bit, and then mix it in with a smudge texture from Grand Warwick. As you can see, this texture looks like someone wiped the floor, and I then increased that by plugging it into a ramp so we can see the texture even better. And this now gets mixed with the texture we saw before. And now you can see this texture looks much more interesting already. But this wasn't enough for me, so I took the texture from Cornelius which has those super small details, which I imagined could be paint, because when you do those floors, you actually want to build up interest, and maybe you uh, use some paint that you mix in, stuff like that, and it looks very industrial. And this I use together with a noise to break it up a bit so it's not everywhere as you can see now we have some darker parts here and there so it's not that obvious and then we mix it in again with the previous texture and now we have those small details all over the place then it's just a small color correct at the end to make it a little bit darker to get more of that concrete feeling and that's about it for the diffuse color. The reflection roughness is a much more simple process, but it's still the same principle. It's still two textures mixed together. Again, that smudge texture, which looks like someone wiped the floor, pretty fitting in that case, as well as a dirt map from Texture Supply, which I kind of liked, especially because of those footprints here. You don't see those in the end, but I thought it was 
kind of nice. And then those two get mixed together again to make it one texture and to break it up a bit, plugging it into a ramp again to remap the values. And the last thing is just a normal map. It's a normal map that came with the concrete texture from Texture Supply. And this all together makes up this floor in the end, which I thought turned out pretty nice. And that's about it, so back to the time lapse. Thanks a lot for watching part two of this series, and make sure to tune in tomorrow to check out part three.